Hello there, I'm back again to ask you, the listener, an enormous favour. It is podcast awards season and the Irish Podcast Awards are very quickly coming up. And I would really appreciate it if you could vote for Real Life Ghost Stories in the Listener's Choice Award for the Irish Podcast Awards. You just need to go to the Irish Podcast Awards dot IE forward slash voting to cast your vote. The voting is open until October the 19th, 2023. You can vote once per email address and you can vote from anywhere in the world. You just need to remember to confirm your vote via email. And I promise you it takes 30 seconds, maybe even a minute at most to cast your vote. And I would appreciate it so much if you could vote for Real Life Ghost Stories. Here's the thing. Most indie podcasts don't have budgets to even enter into most of the award ceremonies that go on for podcasting. And voting in a Listener's Choice Award is just a really good way to advertise for that podcast And the little glimmer of hope that I might actually win brings me a certain amount of joy on a day-to-day basis. So if you are somebody who listens to Real Life Ghost Stories on the reg, if you like the content, I would really appreciate it if you could go to the irishpodcastawards.ie forward slash voting to cast your vote. Thank you. I love you. Enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to 31 Days of Terror 2023, day number four. And I have two spooky stories for you today and the first story comes from Jensen. In 2012, I moved into a small duplex with my girlfriend. She had been living in the upstairs of this duplex for about six months prior to me moving in with her. The upstairs was a very small one-bedroom apartment and the downstairs was gutted to the frame except for the back room, which was a finished laundry room. Our landlord was nice enough to let us use it to do our laundry. Before completely moving into the upstairs apartment with her, I had stayed the night there with her maybe a dozen times or so. She had a small twin-sized bed, which made it pretty awkward for us both to sleep on together, but we did it anyway. It was either the second or third time that I was staying the night with her, I noticed the bed would be gently shaking as if someone was gently pushing on the mattress while we were trying to fall asleep. I asked her if she noticed it and she replied that she did. I kind of just brushed it off as my heartbeat making the bed vibrate and then went to sleep. About a month or so later, I end up moving in with her. We switched out her twin-sized bed for my full-sized bed and even after bringing my new bed there, we would still feel the whole bed shake every night. After moving in, I started to notice more weird things happening after a few weeks. There were three different times we were downstairs doing laundry and we heard footsteps going up each individual step into our apartment. The stairway leading upstairs was directly in the middle of the house and you could see the stairs as the walls were gutted downstairs. She worked a morning shift job and was usually in bed by 11pm. I worked a second shift job and would stay up until 3am or 4am. Many times at night I would be sitting in our living room watching TV or playing video games and out of nowhere I would get an uneasy feeling, as if I was being watched. I would get goosebumps all over my body and all of the hairs on my neck would stand up. The feeling would last maybe five minutes and as quickly as the feeling came on is as quickly as it would go away. This would happen at least two to three times every week. After living with her for about six months, things gradually seemed to happen more. We would hear footsteps more often. I would feel like I was being watched more often. The bed would gently shake literally every night, just minutes after lying down in it. I was always sceptical about the paranormal and I always tried to come up with a rational explanation for what we were experiencing. Then came the night that absolutely shook me to my core and made me a believer. It was about 10pm and she had just left to go out with some friends about 5 minutes prior. I was sitting in the living room scrolling through Facebook and the TV was off. It was dead silent throughout the upstairs. I heard the bottom door open and shut 
and then I heard someone walking up the stairs to our apartment. I thought it was her coming back because she may have forgotten her phone or her wallet or something. At the top of the stairs is another door that opened directly into our apartment. On the outside of the door was a Christmas ornament hanging on the door that we never took down, and every time the door opened it would sway against the door and make noise. I heard footsteps come all the way up to the door. I heard the doorknob turn, and I heard the ornament start swaying against the door as if someone had just entered the apartment. I walked around the corner to greet her at the door, but there was absolutely nobody there. The door was shut. I looked into the bedroom and the bathroom and there was nobody. I opened the door and looked downstairs and there was absolutely no one. I spent the next 30 minutes or so in complete disbelief of what I had just experienced. I tried to come up with a rational explanation but I just couldn't. And then I put all of the pieces together and decided that paranormal activities are a real thing and that this house had some sort of activity going on. She got back home at around 2am and I told her what had happened and asked her what the hell was going on here. She came clean and told me about a bunch of things she had experienced living there by herself before I moved in. She said that she would shower with the shower curtain completely open and would just put towels down on the floor so it didn't get wet. Because if she showered with the curtain closed, she felt like someone was standing right outside the shower curtain every time. She said she felt like she wasn't alone in the house plenty of times and had the same feelings of being watched, and would feel the bed shake at night as well. She didn't want to bring any of it up to me before moving in, because she didn't know how I would respond. We ended up moving out about six months later, because she became pregnant, and we needed a bigger place to stay. Fast forward to two years later, and my friend's sister moved into the same apartment. I had never told my friend about any of the experiences that I had had there. I was over visiting them about a month after she had moved in and I told her that I had lived there about two years ago. She proceeded to ask me if I had ever experienced anything while living there. I smirked a little and asked her, Do you feel the bed shake at night? I'll never forget the look on her face, and she said, Yes, oh my God. We proceeded to talk about the different things we had both experienced, and she went on to tell me that her three-year-old son would randomly be talking to someone that wasn't there, and then said it was a little girl. She also told me that she would get the feeling of being watched quite often as well. I've lived in almost 10 different apartments and houses in the last 15 years and I've never experienced anything like that in any of them except for that one duplex. It 100% made me a believer. Jensen, I love that your girlfriend just didn't say anything because I'd be the same. I'd be like, I'm just not going to say anything about the blatant haunting that is happening in this building. I wonder what the crack was with the bed shaking though. That's a weird one, isn't it? And it, that seems to be quite um, common in poltergeist activity, that people feel the bed shaking, sometimes softly, like vibrating, sometimes violently. And I wonder if that's just whatever the entity is trying to get your attention, because it's a surefire way to get somebody's attention, isn't it? To disturb the place where they sleep. In this instance, I would be really curious to know the history of the building, the history of these apartment blocks, what the land was beforehand, because it almost seems like there's a mix of residual energy and like poltergeist activity going on in this house. And if I've said it once, I've said it before. Actually, no, I think I said about animals being what ghost hunters really need. But I also think that kids should be introduced into ghost hunting TV shows. Bring a kid in. That's better than any sort of spirit box or spectrometer or whatever shit people to be using these days. Because kids be like, yeah, there's just a man over there. Now can I have some snacks? And I'm not surprised, Jensen, that it made you a believer because those stories where you're expecting it to be your loved one, you're not sitting there going, oh, something ghostly is about to happen. You're sitting, you're listening to footsteps come up the stairs and you're thinking, oh, what has she forgotten? I wonder if she forgot her phone or her wallet. And then you're like, oh shit, no, nobody is there. No wonder that made you a believer. I'd be a believer after that. And story number two comes from Zoe. All my life, I've had different paranormal and spiritual experiences. I am now 30 years old. The first experience I can remember was when I was around three years old. I used to have a little musical toy. It was a little television that you used to wind up and the screen would move along with the music. And I remember it used to play on its own. My mum also remembers me bringing her toys and telling her that they were playing on their own. She used to say, you must be doing it yourself, but I definitely wasn't. 
My second experience I remember was when I was around six years old. I was getting into my pyjamas downstairs when my mum had asked me to go upstairs into my bedroom and get my hairbrush. I remember going upstairs and into my bedroom. I tried to turn on the bedroom light but it wouldn't come on. In the corner of the room I had a CD player which was playing the radio. In front of it was my hairbrush. I walked over to the unit where the CD player was and tried to turn it off. This wouldn't switch off despite me flicking the switch up and down. My bedroom had a large double window and positioned directly outside was a lamppost which used to cast its orange light into the room. As it was night time the room was lit from the lamppost outside. While trying to switch the radio off I suddenly got a feeling that there was something in the room. I looked to my right when this feeling came over me and floating in the middle of the room was what I can only describe as a floating mist-like mass. It didn't have any particular shape, but somehow it seemed to be alive. It was clearly moving towards me. I got such a fright that it took my breath away. I immediately turned and ran out of the bedroom and down the stairs, taking two at a time. Have you ever ran up the stairs and got that horrible shiver up your spine that causes you to catch your breath? That's what I was feeling. At the bottom of the stairs you have to make a U-turn around the banister to go up the hallway. When I reached the bottom, I put my arm around the banister post to swing myself around. However, I slipped on the last step and went down. When I tried to get back up I found I couldn't as one of my legs was being pulled backwards. Something was trying to pull me back. I couldn't see anything but there was my leg in the air and I could clearly feel something tugging and pulling. I remember kicking out and feeling it break free and I jumped up and ran up the hallway and into the living room. I can't remember much after this. I know I didn't tell my parents as I thought they might think I was crazy or telling lies. I don't remember experiencing anything else in this house. A good few years later, when I was around 10 or 11 years old, we moved across the street and down a few houses to a three-bedroomed house and with the arrival of my youngest sister, we needed more space. My gran and grandpa were one of the first people to live in this house when it was built. It wasn't particularly old. The people who lived in it before us were a couple who had no children as far as I could remember. It was a lovely house. I didn't experience anything sinister in it, however I do remember several strange things. I'm not sure how long we had lived in the house at this point, but the first thing I remember happening was a little girl speaking to me in my bedroom. I had the little box room at the front of the house. I walked over to my bedside cabinet where I had three porcelain dolls. I bloody hated these dolls but they were gifts and my mum insisted that I had them out on display. I always remember turning them around to face the wall so that they didn't stare. I went into my room to my bedside cabinet and suddenly out of nowhere a little girl's voice said Hello, my name is Kate. I knew it wasn't any of my sister's voices. I couldn't see anything but it freaked me out because at the bottom of one of the porcelain dolls was the name Catherine. Was this spirit trying to play games with me? My mum worked in the primary school just two minutes from the house. On the rare occasion when I was a little older and wasn't well, my mum used to let me stay in the house while she went around to her job in the school for a couple of hours. When I was in alone, I would lie downstairs on the couch and watch TV. I could often hear the pitter-patter of feet in my sister's bedroom upstairs and toy boxes rattling. One time I remember hearing the computer keyboard typing out in the hall where it used to sit. I was so terrified to go out and look at the screen in case a sinister message was written, however there never was. There was a time I remember coming home from a family meal and my mum was standing in the living room staring at the ironing board. Who moved that? she asked. Not me, we would all say. I never left it there. Someone has moved this. While we were out, my mum and dad and sisters, someone or something had moved the ironing board from where my mum had left it. Growing up, she was particularly obsessional in her cleaning and her tidying, so I didn't doubt her for a minute. She knew the minute any of us had touched a curtain, never mind moving an ironing board. I remember a good few occasions sitting doing something like brushing my hair or drawing alone in my room and you could guarantee if I put something I was using down it wouldn't be next to me where I left it. It would have moved somewhere like up on the windowsill. 
I was sitting on the floor at the opposite end of the room alone. One of the most vivid memories I have is particularly interesting. I used to take forever to fall asleep. Finally, just as I was about to doze off, I had the sudden thought that I had to open my eyes. When I opened my eyes, there in the corner of my tiny box room in front of my wardrobe was a little boy. I could tell he wasn't quite there, although I could make everything out such as his eye colour and hair etc. He still had an almost glowing translucent appearance. Classical child move, I turned over and pulled the covers up around my shoulders and squeezed my eyes shut. It was then that I felt a cold, tickling sensation at the back of my neck just below my hairline. It felt as though the little spirit boy was tickling my neck. I pulled the covers up over my head and he disappeared. Years later, my grandpa and I were sitting at the dining table in his house. We used to have wonderful talks about the world and space and God knows what else. One day, we got onto the subject of spirits and the paranormal. He wasn't really a believer. My gran came in to join us. And she said, oh, I've got a story for you. Years ago, when I had your Uncle Brian, he was the middle of the three sons, I couldn't stay in the house myself. Every time I climbed the stairs, a little boy would appear on them, sitting second from the top. He would always be crying. One day I told my friend and she told me not to be scared. It was just a little lost spirit. You have to tell him that you aren't his mummy and he should go and find his way. So that's what I did. The next time he appeared, I bent down and said, I'm not your mummy, it's okay, but you have to go now. At this he stopped crying and looked at me and then quick as a flash he was gone and I never saw him again. I was amazed, but then a thought occurred to me. Gran, what house are you talking about? I asked. And she replied, Oh, the one that you are in just now. I looked at her and then asked, Was he about this height? have blue eyes and blonde hair. She just froze and looked at me. How do you know that? I've seen him before in the house. He appeared to me in my room, but he wasn't crying. Needless to say, she was speechless, but I somehow felt more comfort in the fact that someone else had seen what I had, just many, many years before. I had always tried to convince my parents of spirits, more so my dad. He was never a believer, I remember telling him about the boy and the toys rattling in my sister's room and such, but he would always just laugh at me. One night I said to him, Do you know what, Dad? One of these days, they are going to show themselves to you and prove that they are real. The next morning, my dad called me into his room. What he told me next gave me chills. He said he got up during the night and went to go to the toilet. When he got to the toilet door, he suddenly had the feeling that someone was watching him. He turned and looked down the bottom of the stairs, and there at the bottom of the stairs was a little girl. He said he knew it wasn't any of us as she had very long hair down to her waist. She was just standing at the bottom of the stairs looking up at him. He bolted into the toilet and locked the door too scared to come out for some time. Whenever I tried to speak to him about it following that day, he used to brush me off and shake his head like he didn't want to talk about it. Was this the little girl who tried to speak to me before? Who knows? However, fast forward many years, firstly to 2013. My mum and I had seen a psychic. I won't go into too much detail about everything he said, but one thing in particular that shocked us was at the end of my mum's reading. Just as she stood up to leave, he said, Oh, by the way, you can stop blaming your daughter for stealing your perfume. It's not her. It's the little girl who follows you around. She follows your family. My mum was in shock. All she could say was, Excuse me? A couple of years before, my parents had separated, and my mum and my youngest 13 year old sister moved in with my papa. They had to share a room for a while, which proved to be challenging. My mum had Coco Chanel perfume on her shelf. She rarely ever went out, but if she did, she wore this perfume. It was pretty expensive, so she never wore it casually. She noticed it starting to dwindle and she always got into arguments with my sister accusing her of taking it which my sister denied every time. My mum eventually got her own house and moved out. Fast forward to 2015. I split up with my ex and moved in with my papa to the same bedroom my mum and my sister had slept in. 
I was always very particular about making my bed perfectly and sitting my Build-A-Bear teddy bear in the middle of the pillows. The bear wore little black glasses. Whenever I would come home, you could guarantee the bear's glasses had been removed and placed on top of his head. Fast forward again to 2018. My dad had died the year before. My two friends and I went to the same psychic I had seen in 2013. He didn't recognise me, and I jumped at the chance to go first to get a reading. When I sat down, the first thing he said was, when the four of you walked in here, I was hoping you would come first. I just looked at him and I said, there's only three of us. He just nodded towards the space next to me on the couch. No, he said, there are four of you. Can you not feel her sitting next to you, the little girl who follows you around? She's the one who keeps stealing your spoons. At this point, I didn't know what he was talking about with regards to the spoons. However, two weeks later, my husband, my little baby boy and myself were all in the house. From the kitchen, I heard my husband rattling around in the drawers, eventually shouting, For God's sake, where are all the spoons? I just froze. I hadn't told my husband a lot about what the psychic had said. He doesn't believe at all, therefore there was no way he could have been messing with me. In that particular house that we lived in, toys used to play on their own quite often. Maybe it was the little girl again. One night I had a visit from who I believe was my dad. As previously mentioned, he died in 2017. Three weeks before my firstborn, his first grandchild was born. My son must have only been weeks, maybe days old. I was sitting in his nursery in the rocking chair. The lights were off but the whole light was casting a glow through the half-open bedroom door. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow cross the room. When I looked, there was nothing there. However, on looking back down at my sleeping son in my arms, I suddenly got a freezing cold sensation down the side of my body he was lying. It was a very strange sensation. As much as it was cold, I felt a warm, comforting feeling growing inside. I believe in that moment that it was my dad coming to visit his first grandchild. The psychic told me I have the ability or the sense, and that if I worked on it, I could really use it. Maybe that's why so many things have happened to me over the years, who knows? When I was a nursing student, I worked for a healthcare agency. This involved me covering shifts in lots of different care homes. One particular home was in a beautiful old sandstone building. One of the carers I was working alongside that day gave me a tour of the place before we started. The upstairs part of the building, she told me, was generally filled with residents who sadly had severe dementia and Alzheimer's. When we were on this floor, the woman pointed to one room in particular. She said that every single resident who had ever lived in that room have all complained about two young children who run around the room laughing and playing. At the end of the shift, the carers all gathered in the lounge to hand over to the next shift, I sat in the very corner of the room on an armchair with the other woman I had been working alongside. There was no one at either side of us and the chair I was sitting in was the very corner. No one could squeeze in behind it. The other workers were either standing in the middle of the room or sat in the opposite corner. We were just making small talk about our plans for the weekend when suddenly I felt two sharp taps on my shoulder. The kind of tap that says, excuse me, what do you think you're doing? I could feel the colour drain from my face. The woman opposite me said, Oh my god, are you okay? What's wrong? I just stared at her and told her that someone just tapped my shoulder. Everyone in the room went quiet. One of the carers at the other end of the room said quietly, Um, you're sitting in Mary's chair? Sorry, I replied. At this point I could see the other carers getting a little freaked out. The woman said, You're sitting in Mary's seat. She always sat there and she died a few days ago. I have never gotten out of a seat quicker in my life. I believe that when people pass away, spirits of their family already in the afterlife come to help them on their way. This is not necessarily a spooky story, but I should give a content warning here for infant death. I'm now a qualified nurse of nine years. I work in a neonatal unit in Glasgow, caring for premature and sick babies. I love my job. Most of the babies I work with recover and go home without any issues. Happy endings, if you will. However, there are the very few who are sadly too premature or too ill to pull through. 
Thankfully, there are very few cases. When a little one passes away, they are placed in a cold cot, all dressed and comfortable, where their families can come and spend time with them. They look like little sleeping angels. One night shift after a family had sadly left, after mourning their baby who had passed, I asked the nurse caring for him if I could come in with her to help prepare the body. This would be my first experience of seeing an infant who had passed. On entering the room, I suddenly felt what can only be described as heavy. It felt like I was being pushed to the ground. I saw a baby and helped my colleague to change the bed. After this, I had to go and sit on the windowsill. She asked if I was okay, and I just shook my head in reply. I felt as though the room was filled with so much sadness, and this heavy weight was pushing down on my shoulders. I had to excuse myself and leave the room. I couldn't stay in it any longer. I definitely believe there were spirits in the room, mourning this child or there to take the little one away with them. The second time I experienced an infant passing, it was expected as the little one had a syndrome which wasn't compatible with life. Usually when a little one passes, we help the family bathe and dress the baby and carry out the last rites. However, this family didn't want to do any of these final things. I asked my colleague that night if I could help her carry out the last rites. I was very nervous about this considering my first experience, but for the sake of this little boy, I wanted to do it. As sad as it was, it was a completely different experience. The room felt so light. He looked so peaceful, like a little sleeping angel. I was so grateful to be able to bathe him and dress him. I believe he was at peace now, as he had been in a lot of pain for the three short weeks that he had survived. I believe he had crossed over happily and peacefully. Maybe I experienced this heavy feeling before, as this baby wasn't expected to pass. It was such a shock. However, the other baby was expected to pass as he had a syndrome which was picked up on while the mother was pregnant and everyone knew he was not going to survive. It was just a very sad waiting game. The spirits were already there waiting to take him peacefully away when his body was ready to give up. One last story from the hospital where I work. I wasn't involved, however it is a well-known story between the staff. One night there was a crash call put out. A crash call is put out when there is an emergency such as a cardiac or respiratory arrest. The doctor who received the crash call on his paper began running in the direction of the ward where he was called to. Running down what we call the link corridor, which is a corridor which connects one part of the hospital to A&E. A man shouted to the doctor asking for directions. The doctor kept running explaining he was going to an emergency and the place he was looking for was in the opposite direction, pointing as he ran. When the doctor arrived at the crash call, he froze. The man lying on the bed was the man who had just asked for directions. He had passed away. Apparently, the doctor got the CCTV, and on it you could see the doctor running and then pointing and talking as the man asked for directions. However, on the CCTV, there was no one else in the corridor except for the doctor. Well, wouldn't that change your whole perspective on life if you were that doctor? Good Lord. And I imagine that hospitals up and down... The world have various stories like this. I'm not going to focus too much on the infant death stories because I think that for some people they find it so difficult to listen to people talk about infant death. But I just wanted to say that I think it's amazing that you work with premature babies and work in those difficult conditions where actually unfortunately from time to time babies babies do die and it is a harsh reality and it is nice to know that there are people working on those wards who really care about those little ones and care about looking after the families at that time. And it sounds like, for whatever reason, Zoe, your family have had this little girl following you for a really long time. I know the psychic said, you know, you've got this little girl following you. And obviously, you know, you can take what psychics say with a pinch of salt. But it does sound like you were experiencing strange things in the house from the time that you were a child, from toys turning on radios turning on to seeing that really strange mist in your bedroom and being almost dragged back up the stairs like that is honestly nightmare fuel and maybe this is one of those situations where it's another generational thing where your grandmother maybe has has some sort of ability that she has passed down because clearly you experience these things she experienced these things other members of your family seem to have experienced things but not in not in as significant a way as you did 
and not in as significant a way as your grandmother did? Was the little boy that was in the house a spirit that resided in the house itself? And then was the little girl a completely separate entity that was attached to your family for some reason? And it is lovely to hear yet another story of a loved one coming back to support a family member or coming back in this instance to see your dad coming back to see his grandson for the first time. And I'd love to know about your grandmother, whether she similarly had different experiences throughout her life. And maybe this gift has just been passed down to you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Thank you to Jensen and Zoe for sending in your stories. Remember, if you would like to send in your story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for some extra content, you can subscribe to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash reallifeghoststories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you tomorrow. Hello there, I'm back again to ask you, the listener, an enormous favour. It is podcast awards season and the Irish Podcast Awards are very quickly coming up. And I would really appreciate it if you could vote for Real Life Ghost Stories in the Listener's Choice Award for the Irish Podcast Awards. You just need to go to the irishpodcastawards.ie forward slash voting to cast your vote. The voting is open until October the 19th, 2023. You can vote once per email address and you can vote from anywhere in the world. You just need to remember to confirm your vote via email. And I promise you it takes 30 seconds, maybe even a minute at most to cast your vote. And I would appreciate it so much if you could vote for Real Life Ghost Stories. Here's the thing, most indie podcasts don't have budgets to even enter into most of the award ceremonies that go on for podcasting and voting in a listener's choice award is just a really good way to advertise for that podcast and the little glimmer of hope that I might actually win brings me a certain amount of joy on a day-to-day basis. So if you are somebody who listens to Real Life Ghost Stories on the reg if you like the content I would really appreciate it if you could go to the Irish Podcast Awards.ie forward slash voting to cast your vote. Thank you. I love you. Enjoy the episode.